Hi, I'm Derek, and this is DC to Daylight, where we explore the world of electronics in the realm of DC audio frequencies RF and into the visible spectrum of light. In this video, we'll be exploring Zener diodes. We'll take a brief look at the differences between an avalanche diode and the Zener diode, and we'll look at the current and voltage transfer characteristics on a curve tracer and then check out an application using analog gauges that will hopefully help understand what Zener action is. So let's jump right in. In order to understand Zener operation, we first need to understand the standard PN junction or small signal diode. Now diodes are composed of two differing semiconductor materials, P and N, which in their initial state are composed of a silicon grade semiconductor substrate. For example, this 300 millimeter intrinsic wafer, which is 99.9999999% pure silicon. Impurities are added to two specific regions, which give them either a surplus or deficiency of electrons. The process of adding these impurities is called doping. If you're interested in the physics of semiconductor doping, there's a link in the description pointing to an ebook I wrote on bipolar junction transistors. Be sure to check out part one, which deals with the physics of PN junctions. Now, PN junctions are not all that dissimilar from a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay, well that's not entirely true, but as I don't have semiconductor process equipment in my lab, we'll be using toast as our substrate. Peanut butter will stand in as our P-type material, where we have a lack of electrons, and jelly will stand in as our N-type material with an excess of free electrons. As I dope my intrinsic substrate with impurities, a natural equilibrium is created where the two materials come into contact with each other. This is known as the depletion region, where electrons and holes swap places until that equilibrium is reached and a kind of barrier develops. If I were to apply a forward bias voltage across the diode, it would take approximately 0.7 volts to overcome this barrier. For that reason, it's called the barrier potential, also known as knee voltage or threshold voltage. Further increasing this voltage leads to an increase in current, but the voltage across the diode remains at a steady 0.7 volts, give or take a few tenths of a millivolt depending on the temperature. We can explore that visually using my poor man's curve tracer. Here I've got a variable AC power supply which once belonged to a train set. To that I've attached a circuit board with binding posts. Our device center test is connected between the binding posts and the AC voltage flows through that device, swinging between, in this case, negative nine volts through zero volts and up to plus nine volts back and forth. I have two BNC connectors which will be plugged into my oscilloscope. On one side, it measures the voltage across the device center test, and on the other side, it measures the voltage developed across a current limiting resistor. So essentially, we have measurements of a varying voltage and current across the device center test. If we put the oscilloscope into XY mode, we can plot the voltage current curve or VI curve of the device we're looking at and see exactly what's going on. So let me plug in a Jellybean 1N4148 small signal diode, and we can immediately see that as the voltage swings between plus and minus nine volts, we don't actually start conducting until we hit about 0.7 volts as standard diodes like to do. A Zener diode has an interesting VI curve characteristic. When forward biased, the diode begins conducting at around 0.7 volts, just like the 1N4148. However, if we reverse bias the diode and apply enough voltage, we enter into what is known as the breakdown region. It's a scary name, but this vertical slope is actually where we want to operate. And to complicate things, there are actually two different types of diode action that are categorized under the Zener umbrella. Actual Zener diode action, which results from quantum tunneling, both P and N materials are heavily doped. Electrons can tunnel through the barrier, and this action is gradual until sufficient voltage is applied to reach the more linear portion of reverse breakdown. This is what the VI curve looks like on our poor man's curve tracer. We have the standard turn on at 0.7 forward bias, and about negative three volts, we can see the tunneling through the depletion region begin to occur. Notice how it's a gradual curve until the voltage is increased in the negative direction very steeply. This is something to be aware of when designing circuits using Zener diodes. You may want to stay out of this nonlinear region. The other type of diode, arguably incorrectly categorized as Zener, is the avalanche diode. In the case of the avalanche, which is lightly doped, electrons may have enough velocity to cross over the depletion region, knocking into other free electrons, which creates a runaway or avalanche condition, hence the name avalanche. On the curve tracer, we see the same basic characteristic curve as the Zener, 
but note that the knee where conduction occurs is much sharper. In general, zeners rated at 6 volts and less are true zener diodes, and above that are actually avalanche diodes, though there can be a combination of the two effects going on at the same time, just something to be aware of. Here's a little demonstration that shows how a zener diode behaves in its reverse breakdown configuration. I have a variable power supply connected to a voltmeter, which I'll ramp up from 0 to 16 volts, and you'll of course see that change. Then we have an ammeter, which is measuring the total current in the zener circuit. That represents the zener itself, the uh, zener impedance, the resistor, and any load that you might have attached across this guy. And we have a third gauge, which is monitoring the voltage across the zener diode itself. In this case, I'm using a 10 volt zener from my jelly bean parts bin. The series resistor limits the current while the zener is conducting. And we'll talk about how to select that resistor in a moment. But if we look at our curve, we are actually increasing the voltage, right? Increasing the potential. But since this is reverse biased, this represents a negative voltage on our graph. So when we hit that zener voltage, the diode will begin to conduct, increasing the current through here, okay? Limited by this resistor. Now a zener, you should really read the data sheet, and I don't have the data sheet for the one that I'm using, but we have to maintain a minimum current in order for a zener operation to operate in this linear region. We also want to avoid IZM, which is the maximum zener current from the data sheet. Um, that could also be catastrophic. And we also want to not exceed the power rating of the diode itself. So this one in particular I know is a half a watt. So any calculations that we do with voltage and current here we cannot exceed half a watt or frowny face also. So what's going to happen is that we're going to ramp the voltage up and we'll see this gauge rise. The voltmeter across the zener will also increase and track this one because this is essentially an open circuit at low voltages. Because the current's flowing through this meter, through this resistor, through our voltmeter to ground until we go to where this starts to conduct, okay? Then the current is diverted away from here and flows through the diode. And as that increases, it'll actually stop at 10 volts, around 10 volts, all right? It will remain there even if we increase the voltage further. So let's see what that looks like. Now I'm gonna increase my power supply voltage and you'll see these meters here will track each other. Continuously increasing, we're seeing some leakage current. And as we approach 10 volts, we're actually kind of hitting this knee right here and we'll start to see some current flow through this circuit. And there we go, we're at basically 10 volts. We're seeing the current increase, I'm increasing the voltage and this remains constant at 10 volts. So even if I lower it, increase it, we're still at 10 volts. This guy is acting as a regulator. If I were operating this as like a power supply regulator and my supply line voltage had sagged too far, okay, which I'm kind of doing here, eventually this guy falls out of regulation, right? We're coming out of this knee voltage back and turning the diode off. So when I get down past a certain point, you know, my power supply regulator is failing, okay? So the next question is how do we select the resistor for this circuit? Well, it's actually not that difficult. Uh, resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. We take the supply voltage, we subtract the zener voltage uh, across this guy, and we divide it by the minimum zener current if you wanted to operate right at the knee, and that comes from our data sheet. I wanna add a little bit more current so that I'm in this more linear region, so let's look at that. Resistance is equal to our 14 volts that we're supplying here under normal conditions. That's my constraint, minus the 10 volts. That gives us four divided by 15 milliamps which is equal to 267 ohms, okay? So for that current, you know, neglecting this 20 ohms of the zener impedance, and that comes from the data sheet, right? It could range from 20 ohms to, you know, 200 ohms. So consult your data sheet, but I'm neglecting this right now because it's not, it doesn't really impact this that much. So four divided by 15 milliamps, 267. I'm gonna go down in value, which is gonna increase my current and push me a little closer here to this linear region. Current is equal to four divided by 220. I'm gonna recalculate that 15 milliamps I got with this new resistor, that's 18 milliamps. Now, I may have a load attached to it, okay? And some of that current is gonna get diverted here, okay? But typically this is gonna be like you're driving some other thing like an op amp as a voltage reference, and it's not gonna be, you know, maybe it'll be 100,000 ohms. So it's really not gonna impact this all that much. But I wanna make sure that I'm not dissipating too much power. And the power through my resistor is the 18 milliamps times the four volts across it, right? Which is equal to 72 milliwatts. That's basically nothing. So we can use a quarter watt resistor for that. Power through the zener on the other hand, if we take 18 milliamps and multiply it by the 10 volts across it, 
we get 180 milliwatts. That's getting to be kind of considerable. Now this is a half watt Zener, so I know that I'm safe there. But this is one reason why people argue that Zeners are not really that great as regulators because they are always dissipating some power. So you really wouldn't want to use this in a low power application. So I also want to reiterate that we don't want to exceed the power rating of the diode and we don't want to exceed IZM, which is our maximum Zener current that comes from the data sheet. Otherwise, well, I hope that demonstration in conjunction with looking at VI curves on the scope helps you understand Zener operation a little more clearly. I know I wasn't able to cover all of the details about Zeners like temperature coefficients and process variation affecting internal Zener resistance, but this at least gets you started there at a first approximation. I had a great time making the demo and it was a lot of fun making the train set curb tracer and watching it come alive. I hope you enjoyed it as well. So do you have an interesting application for Zener diodes or have you used them in place of a linear regulator? Let me know down in the comments or catch me at element14.com slash DC to daylight. And of course, engage with all of us at the element14 community at element14.com. Links are all down in the description. That's it for me. Have a good one. Not bad. <laughs>